Great. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, just in case you don't know where you're at, <laughs> this place is really confusing. Um, you are now in the orientation mobility support the home environment um, for the for preschoolers. So if that's not what you were wanting to be at, I take no offense if you need to leave. <laughs> or if what we're talking about just is like, oh, this isn't quite worked for me or my kids. I take no offense if you leave. Um, so um, I'm Diane Gaffney, and I'm an orientation and mobility specialist. And before we get started, um, I wanted to just kind of, I, I would love to like sit down and talk with everyone and figure out who you are, but obviously we don't have time for time for that. But I am just curious um, how many are parents of a child who's visually impaired? So the rest are professionals, I'm guessing? No? Grandparents. Grandparents. Okay, parents are grandparents. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna um, apologize because I'm probably gonna keep saying parents, but I'm, you're included in that in, in all of the things, aunts and uncles, caregivers, whatever whatever your role is. Um, and for how many is this your first preschool conference that you're at? Okay, so kind of kind of new. Um, how many have done either that movement session that just took place this morning or any kind of orientation and mobility session? Anything? Okay. So a lot of people already have some kind of thing. Um, so for those of you who have done that, a lot of this is probably going to be review, and I'm hoping that maybe there'll be like one or two things that might be a spark or something new. Um, but I always say it's 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 not rocket science, and um, a lot of it is it's good to hear hear again and again, and hopefully in a new in a new way, and just to get your thing in. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm gonna go, hopefully, I can figure out this. There we go. Um, just really quick, three truths and a lie. A lot of people do this for um, icebreakers and stuff. Um, you guys have to pick out which one is not true about me. So I have worked as an o and specialist for 31 years in Wisconsin. Hard to believe because I'm only 39. <laughs> um, seven years have been in birth to six. One year was with adults, and the rest of the years have been in the school systems in the CESA, either CESA six or CESA seven, um, with three to 21 year olds. Uh, my second one, okay, my first career lasted less than two years as a packaging engineer, a degree in uh, Bachelor's of Science in Industrial Technology, and concentration in packaging. And yes, that is actually something no one ever has ever heard of that. Um, the second, the last, the second, third one, I love kids. I have six children, three boys, three girls. Um, and last, I'm orient I am married to an O&M specialist. And the first time I met him, he was in a rainbow tutu at a conference. <laughs> so who thinks um, number one is my lie? Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> who thinks number two is my lie? No. Okay. Who thinks number three is my lie? And who thinks number four is my lie? Okay. So it is number three. Um, I do love kids. That's not the lie part. But um, I do have only two boys that are my own boys. Um, but I also have one um, AFS son who is from Spain and two AFS daughters, one from Austria and Italy. So I only have five kids. <laughs> um, and that two two story is for another time around a campfire. <laughs> so um, basically, our goals for today um, we're going to share kind of an overview of OM for young kids. We're going to talk about OM in three boxes. We're going to talk about a toolbox, we're going to talk about a toy box. And we're going to switch on a treasure box. And then hopefully we'll have time at the end for anyone who's interested and it, there's no pressure to do a blindfold simulation, blindfold or um, vision simulator simulation. Okay. Um, with that being said, as far as my introduction, I, yes, I've been doing this for a long time, but I get kind of humbled and nervous and being asked to do these things because there's so many people that know more than me and have been doing this longer and I am by far not an expert and don't know all the answers and all the questions I'm constantly learning. I mean, I'm constantly learning from my kids and my families, my parents. Um, so I'm not going to claim to have all the answers, but if you have questions throughout this, please feel free to interject and, you know, we'll have this kind of be a conversation throughout. 
Um, and hopefully if there's anyone joining us on, you know, live, we'll be able to include them as well. Um, this is really obnoxious, so we're going to just go through all of this here. Um, okay, so what is orientation mobility? We'll go into more detail. Orientation basically is what I use with my kids of where, where, how. Knowing where you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. And however they're able to figure that out is what we want to what we want to focus on. Um, and where, where, how is, is a lesson that I do a lot with, with kids all the time. Um, mobility is obviously moving, moving safely, as safely as independently as you possibly can. It's going to include all the gross motor skills and figuring out what motivates those kids to move. Because um, sometimes that can be kind of a challenge and understandably. Um, mobility is a lot of sensory things, sensory awareness. Um, but then along with that goes a lot of sensory sensitivities and defensiveness that might that might come into play and just utilizing your senses all of your senses. Um, it's also concepts, spatial, positional, objects, relations, any kind of concept you can imagine needs to be understood, um, again, to the best of their ability. We're gonna talk about landmarks and clues. That's a biggie for orientation and mobility. And obviously independence. We want them to be as independent as possible. Um, a lot of people will say, you know, age appropriate independence, but that um, is kind of, that isn't necessarily always the case because it, it's just, you, you need to meet them where they're at and always be including as much as independence as possible. So for some that may be true independence and in others it's meaning that they're just needing to rely on a sighted guide and have, um, have adult assistance. Um, then we're gonna get into canes and tools, um, push toys, walkers, um, adaptive mobility devices, includes play spaces like the little room or, or play spaces, um, mini routes, and then natural environments in the community. So like I said, bring up bring up any any questions along the way. Tandy Anthony is an orientation mobility specialist, um, probably as old as me or older, um, who has been is is very well known. And she has kind of a nice formula for purposeful movement that I just wanted to touch on briefly. Uh, she talks about, there's a lot of components that go into the expectations for mobi orientation mobility for kids. Um, and I will keep saying O&M or orientation mobility, same thing, obviously. Um, but there needs to be a physical readiness and that comes into play where we're really working with the OTs and PTs to make sure that their gross motor, they've met those gross motor milestones and they're um, physically able to do what they might be expected. Um, it's just, it's just imperative, but also realizing that that milestone development may not happen in the same sequence. There may be, there may be pockets or holes. Um, there needs to be a cognitive connection to some degree. And again, that understanding of concepts, object permanence, means and spatial relations. And then another really big key is that motivation and motivation and figuring out um, what their preferences are and and where they're at. And it is really key to meet the child where they're at and to have the expectations. You know, if they're not able, you know, physically able to hold a spoon or to, you know, maneuver tools even in a, in a fine motor way, they're probably not gonna be able to hold on to a cane as well, right? So we can't be pushing them where they're not at. As much as we want them to be at that stage and that. At, at, at whatever stage you might have in, in mind. It's just a really, really important to meet them where they're at and obviously help them get to where they need to, where they need to be, but um, respecting where they are in, in those things. So today, like I mentioned, we're gonna talk about um, a couple boxes because my background is packaging engineer <laughs> um, for a very short time. So I like boxes. So first of all, we're gonna talk about a toolbox. And basically that is containing just what the child uses, what they use to learn about, um, how they move in their environment, how they move safely. And for a lot of times, and, and how to be as independent as possible. For a lot of my kids at any age, um, you know, it, and, and to help them problem solve on their own, 
what they need in that toolbox is kind of what the goal will want to be, right? And so if they walk outside and it's like, it's so bright, I can't see anything. And it's like, what do you have in your toolbox that can help you? <laughs> do you have sunglasses? Do you have a hat? Do you, you know, can't see something that's far away? What can we use to help you? You know, is there binoculars or binoculars or can we move closer and, and all of those sorts of things. So referring to, giving them ownership of what's in their toolbox. And, and we, as, as um, therapists and specialists and, and parents and grandparents, we want to help fill that toolbox and know what's in that toolbox so that we can support them and eventually just give them the, the freedom to use their toolbox as they need. Um, then, of course, there's going to be the toy box, which is the fun stuff. But um, a lot of those items in their toy box might not even be toys. It might be everyday items that they use as toys, but it helps them learn about concepts, about movement, about their senses. And then there's the treasure box, and that's the good stuff. That's the stuff that we want to be getting to, um, the adventures that happen beyond their home, beyond your home. I know we're talking about um, home environments and how you can support them, but our goal right, is to get them comfortable in all environments and to get them as independent as possible. So that treasure box will be all the good things that are beyond the animal. And we need to kind of just think outside that box, right? It's hard to put everything in a box because there's always going to be something and every child is unique. Um, and there's going to be their own unique ideas and things that work. Okay, I just need to kind of keep an eye on my time. Um, so when it comes to our toolbox, we're going to be talking, you want to think about just obviously using all of your senses, not just vision, mini routes, the where, where, how, concepts, landmarks, independence, special techniques, mobility devices, canes, and I'm buzzing through this because we're going to go through all of them individually. Okay, so our use of the senses, obviously, if they have whatever vision they have, you want to have them utilize that to the best of their ability and giving them the tools that they may need to help, to help them use that. And there's all kinds of great sessions on low vision aids and, and that we're not gonna, I'm not gonna get into all of that because that's a whole other, whole other talk. But in addition to um, using their vision, obviously their sense of touch is huge and really important. And yet at the same time, a lot of kids are defensive or sensitive with their touch and not, not wanting to reach out with their hands. But lo and behold, their feet can be a great way to learn, right? And I'm sure that everyone has has seen that. Um, and that's a, that's there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's it's a great thing. So as much time as they can spend barefoot in a lot of different environments, if they want to explore with their feet, have at it. I think that's a, that's a great wonderful thing to do. Um, a lot of kids will have you know. OTs are, are great at, you know, making sure that they're using two hands with interacting and crossing that line and, and, you know, exploring with their whole hand and not just finger touch and that sort of thing. Um, so important. And again, moving towards where the goal is of actually holding on to a cane. You know, they have to be able to, to do all those things. And they have to be able to not only use, hold on to a cane, but use their hand for trailing or holding their backpack or, uh, or something. So using two hands is um is really important obviously and encouraging that in any any and every situation is is what you want to do hearing obviously um is is important and often a misconception as many people have probably heard that oh they can't see so they have great hearing you no know, but they don't necessarily have you know supersonic hearing <laughs> but they're needing to learn how to to use their hearing in maybe different ways than what than what we do. We are a visual world. We, we are a visual society, and we we learn so much from our vision. By taking that away, we we want to hone in and really um, teach them how to use their hearing to localize sounds, to identify sounds, um, to be able to use echolocation, which is a pretty advanced skill, but can be done. Um, can, can, can be done. <laughs> and, and, and there's lots of different ways that you can try to help them hone into the echolocation of hearing the sound bounce off of walls or a pillar or even a tree or a pole or a ball that's in the air or something like that. Um, it's not 
it's not for everyone. And I know I was just asked on last week, you know, does everybody have that? Can everybody do it? And I think just like anything, right? We have our good, you know, we have our strong points. Everyone has their strong points. It's not to say that it's not something that you can't explore and look at, but you it's it's a pretty advanced skill and it takes a lot. I've only had a handful of kids that have really been able to do that to a to a big extent. Um the sense of our sense of smell, I think, is very often overlooked and we take for take for granted it's our first sense to develop. Um, it's so powerful and can bring back many memories. I think a lot of people have probably had their own experience of smelling something and having a memory of childhood, right? Um, and so I think it's really good and important to use utilize senses, um, senses of smell in daily routines, right? And and pointing that out so that kids can put those things together that, you know, that that candle that you smell is always in the bathroom burning or hopefully not <laughs> in a safe way, but, you know, or that you're always, you know, you're smelling um, the food in the kitchen that's telling you that you're in, that you're in the kitchen um, using those, but realizing that they're, most smells are not constant. They're, they're a clue. They're something that's going to be um, come and go and not be all the time. Our sense of taste, obviously, is for many of us, it's a really good one. But for young kids with, with a lot of sensory issues, it's a dif difficult one, right? Um, really eating, um, exploring new foods between the texture and the taste is um, can be a battle. And that can be a really, really difficult thing. Um, so obviously, working with the speech and language um, pathologists, OTs, they can help get through and get past some of those food sensitivities, um, that sort of thing. And I know there's often, there's always that question is my kid won't eat anything, but they get they have everything in their mouth, right? Because that's how they're exploring. So even though they're not necessarily tasting that toy, <laughs> they're exploring it in with a new one of their other senses. Um, and there's, there's that give and take because you want to let them explore wherever they're at, right? So we want to meet them where they're at but we can't send them to school and them having them looking and eating everything in the classroom because of obvious, obvious sanitizing. So trying to channel that, trying to um, work that into other ways is, um, can, be, can be done often with, a, with other therapists as well. And then we get into your non-typical senses of just proprioception, of getting that input in the joint in your joints, sensory seeking kids who want to be jumping all the time, <laughs> um, that they need that, they need that input, they need that sense. And um, then also the sense of just vestibular movement, um, understanding their body awareness, balance, and all of those good things. So that's one of our tools in our toolbox. Another one is just mini rubs. So I always say, you know, I mean, you are, O&M is like all the time. It's not just 30 minutes, 60 minutes a week with the with their therapist. O and M is every day, all day, in the homes, in you know wherever you're going, in the car, all of that sort of thing. So there's lots of little um, little routes that you want to be taking, introducing them to, um, getting from their their bedroom to the bathroom would be a great, great one, right? You know, and obviously kids when they're little, they're carried from place to place. It's just unnatural. A natural thing, but the, the sooner that they can be in control and they can be taking part in those routes and those routines, um, is gonna it, it's gonna make sense of their world, and that's what we want to do. We want we don't want this you know good fairy syndrome that they are in one place and then they appear in another place magically. Um, they need to have they need to make sense of their world and have and learn through their hands and their and understand. So. They should be uh, motivating activities. They should um, be purposeful and and have something at that ends at the, at the at the end that they get a that, that they get a result. Um, you want to obviously like keep changing that. You want you probably want to start with the same thing all the time, and then maybe increase the distance or, or add more routes to it. Have an include include a beginning and an ending of a landmark like you know naming that we're gonna we're gonna start in the kitchen and we're gonna walk to the living room or your toy area um, and that sort of thing. And, and naming not only the landmarks at the beginning and end, but also what's maybe along the way. Um, and then you wanna work towards them just walking in open spaces and doing that comfortably and safely with um, 
with protection. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do just to make things safe, um, giving some high contrast, things like a, a floor rug or putting tape on the stairs, um, having lighting in dimly lit areas or um, rope lighting, um, Christmas lights, all of those sorts of things can help, maybe along a hallway or in dark areas. Um, and you want to reduce clutter in in a pathway or in, in general in, in your home and, and have everything have its have its place. Um, which I know is easier said than done, especially in, in most in most homes. Um, and then you want to include also think about like sound sounds to help with orientation along those routes, wind chimes, um, a clock that's ticking. I have a bird clock in my kitchen. So every hour it goes off and there's a different bird. Um, you know, they have dog ones and all kinds of things like that. So, you know, just having something that they can use to help them, help them make sense and um, put things together. And then you want to make it fun. You want to make it a game and get an I spy. Um, and, and it shouldn't always be work. <laughs> it's just going to be their natural and their environment. Um, next, we're going to talk about concepts. And concepts we've been talked about for a long time. But basically, um, there's so much that are that is visual that is learned through concepts that kids will miss out on. And so taking the time to um, under, have, letting them understand their body, um, understand the body concepts, learning their body moves, all the body parts, doing that through fun songs and games. I mean, that's just kind of a typical thing, but including it in your your daily routines is is really important. Um, and then, you know, learning about left and right, your body has two, you know, has two sides, exploring how your body moves and understand, you wanna start, once they start really understanding their body and how it moves, you wanna have them understand their body in relation to other objects. And that would be you know, utilizing a push toy and interacting with toys um, in different in different ways. And then actually having two toys and object to object and having that, that gets to be more advanced. Um, and lots of lots and lots and lots of games that you can end up doing. Um, to help them to help them understand the, the concept. So when we were talking about the routes, you can have, this is obviously for a, a classroom because it's talking about vision and work, and, but you can have little um, routines, predictable routines with symbols that would let them know what's coming next. And you could have this same little symbol on a door that would be where it would take place. Okay, so, or even you can, you can have a toothbrush taped on a taped on a thing, and you know to let them know we're going to be going to the to the bathroom, and we're going to be brushing our teeth, and that's going to be the symbol for the bathroom. And then obviously in the bathroom there will be a toothbrush, but you could even go as far as having, you know, having that by your door. I don't like necessarily feeling like parents need to go and change their whole house and label everything <laughs> and put little things that, you know, I mean, it needs, we're doing it in a natural environment and in a natural way is going to be easier for everyone. Um, these are things that they would be working towards in school probably. So if you can help by getting them used to that, that's going to, that's going to help make sense for them even, even more. Um, I know I had a parent ask, you know, well, should I put labels on, you know, real labels on all of my cabinets? And I'm like, well, you can, you know, but you know, it's it's that's it's not a bad thing, but don't feel like that's what you you know you have to do. There's there's that there's that fine balance of making adaptations for your home or for the school, and then there's what's what's in the real world and what they're going to incur what they're going to encounter in everyday life and in the real world. And so, as much as you want to do everything for your child, you want to you know don't. Don't put that burden on you as like, I have to change everything that I'm doing and, and not have it be in a natural way. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so, and then obviously um, looking at just basic things like shapes, puzzles, parts, whole, all of those things relate to um, our, our important for mobility. Um, Next in the toolbox would just be like landmarks and clues and the 
The difference between landmarks and clues are landmarks are going to be something that's permanent or to pretty permanent. So in your home, it's going to be your furniture. Um, that they're going to be, know that the couch is always in the same spot for the most part. I mean, it's not to say that you can never move your furniture in your house ever, but if you do, you want to give them that heads up and orient them to any changes that may be traffic speed. Um, so when you're outdoors, it might be, you know, a tree in your backyard or, you know, what they always, a fence that they go past on the way to the, on, on the driveway or something, something that they can always know is going to be there to help make sense of where they are. And then clues are going to be things that are there, but maybe not all the time. Like we mentioned, the things that you smell, some sounds like fan that's running, heater appliances, those sorts of things. They're there, but they're, you can't always rely on them um, to be there. So one of the big things in that toolbox is that independence and their level of independence and their willingness and their motivation to be independent. Um, oftentimes kids are with a visual impairment or blind are very hesitant to move out and explore. Um, and so giving them that sense of security, that sense of feeling comfortable and safe and being able to move in a safe way and knowing that, that, they, um, that they can do this with your help and then eventually start um, having that help back off is, is so important and finding what motivates them to get them out and to, to, to get them um, want to be moving out on their own. And even at a young age, that independence, I'm sure we all know there's, there's some of those strong little kids that they have that no problem <laughs> um, and they want to be doing it. And then there's some others that maybe they just are comfortable just sitting back and, and, and being moved for them, you know, being relying on other people. So um, as caregivers, parents, grandparents, we want to be persistent in just finding out what motivates them to move out, to help them overcome those fears, getting them involved in those daily routines, having them, you know, help with cleanup. Um, you know, obviously, you know, they're not going to maybe fill the whole dishwasher <laughs> and they're little, but, you know, is there one thing that they can be doing? you know, keeping it simple, but meaningful and, and real, you know, having them, giving them maybe their own drawer or cabinet that they're getting their plates out and putting it at the table every time um, so that they know where it is. And then eventually they can help set the table for everybody. Um, but, you know, keeping it simple, but giving them, making them part of those daily routines is so important. Obviously hands-on encouragement, hands-on involvement with just everything and um, adult meeting needs. So some, a few just special techniques that come along with orientation that you may, or mobility that you may hear about is um, self-protection. We talked about, we wanna encourage them to not just be cruising and, and walking um, and trailing, but, or walking with someone, but to be walking through open spaces. And, you know, that's what they're gonna be doing, hopefully within their, within their home, but doing that in a safe way and we want to be able to have them be protected. Um, we want to, well, you want to talk about trailing, squaring off, and sighted guide. And so we'll talk just briefly about some of those before we go on. Um, and most of you have probably done this many times or and seen it. Um, but for kids, for young kids, Side of guide is just holding hands with mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, right? For the most part. But I think it's really important that you use those terms because as they get older, they're, that's what they're going to be doing. Um, every little kid is holding mom and dad's hand. But for kids who are blind or visually impaired, they may need to be doing that throughout their whole life. And obviously you're not, you know, as a 10 year old, you don't want to be holding mom and dad's hand, but holding them sighted, holding hand sighted guide grabbing at an elbow is, is okay. So I think it's really important to use those terms and have them get used to it as, as well as other fam, all the family members. Um, so for real young children, they might be holding your fingers, they might be holding your hand, eventually they'll hold your wrist. And then for older children, they'll hold an elbow. And basically you're just obviously walking together, the person who is sighted or as they call um, there's a little bit of a terminology. They also call it human guide because you don't have to be fully sighted to be to be um, to be a guide for someone who is blind. But 
the person who can see better is typically the one who's in front <laughs> and guiding the person who, who is visually impaired behind. And they just work together, um, acting in, as a team and working together, making sure that there's enough space to get through narrow passages, um, to get through doorways. They're gonna put their arm, the guide is gonna put their arm behind them to walk together, um, giving them to, some touch cues, like if they need to find their seat, they'll put their hand on the chair and then that person is where the chair is. Um, going up and down stairs, they can do that together, letting the, the person who is visually impaired hold onto the railing and they walk up literally one step ahead because that's gonna be the goal. So, um, yeah, sighted guide, like I said, at a young age is just it happens normally, but do you want to just it's important to kind of use those terms. Um hold on one second. I think we're out of sync here a little bit, but that's okay. Um I'm just gonna back up. The upper the protection technique, the upper hand, um you wanna just one of one of my things I think is just that's just important is that kids learn how to react quickly, right? Because how many kids you see with goose eggs on their head or you know scrapes and bruises, and and so just for them to be able to react to that hands up and teach them that they you know that they're going to put their hands in front of them, not necessarily on their head because that doesn't help so much, but that they if they hit something they'll have some reaction to it. Um, there's kind of an official upper hand protection and a lower hand protection technique that you want to use because this is going to catch things that are at that level and they're this big they don't necessarily need that so much <laughs> um but that's that ideally that's what they're going for but what i like to just make sure that they're encouraging is that they that they can react to a hands up to be able to react quickly um so doing that through a game and doing that in a fun way is, is really good um, trailing is going to be obviously it can start moving. They're just naturally hanging onto things and cruising, and then it ends up leading to um, trailing just with one hand. Possibly, you know, they'll trail with two hands. They're going to trail with one hand, hopefully, because eventually that cane's going to hopefully be in in the other hand. Um, so trailing furniture, trailing walls. Most houses, there's not a lot of places to truly trail. We have a great trailing wall in this room right here along the along the side hallways can be our great places to practice trailing um and again you're getting them ready for doing that in a school setting um, to be able to be to be trailing and walking along the hall and it just gives them that extra sense of security hopefully and and motivation and then um just another quick thing is as far as is going through open spaces is to start talking about squaring up and that's just putting their back to something, whether it's a table or a wall and it helps them get centered. Um, and I always say nose and toes in the same direction because a lot of times things are like this <laughs> as they're moving and their feet are going one way and they're looking another way. So you just talk about, you know, you want them facing you and that works on that sound localization, but if they're nose and toes, facing the same direction and they will hopefully be able to be squared off to be able to make a, a straight line of a line of that. Okay. Okay, we went through this there is a bus crew here. Um another another thing in our in our toolbox is just getting ready um with mobility devices and using push toys like little shopping carts, riding toys like the little bikes or scooters and that sort of thing are great ways for them. The little cozy coops, perfect because they're completely enclosed and they can you know start moving around. It can be a really scary thing though getting into that little cozy coop for someone who can't see at all. So a lot of those things um, need to be introduced in a, in a gradual way maybe or in small little pieces um and they it just helps them learn you know how to if i hit something i need to you know it's gonna i have to stop i have to move around it um and then you know being able to check it out and figure out what it is that they're that they're doing or what they found and then there's a kind of a whole another um thing called adaptive mobility devices which would be kind of like getting ready for a cane and it's off, they're often used, I had one, but I didn't, didn't make it here. <laughs> um, they're, they're usually made out of PVC piping. They're often handmade. 
and um, they're usually using needing two hands to hold on to. And again, it's kind of just like a flimsy push toy in a sense. Um, it's not meant to be leaning on giving them support, but it's just a precursor to a cane and can often is often just used for a very brief time until they can can use a cane um, directly. And I've got just a couple kind of poor drawings about uh, of a few different um, adaptive mobility devices that shows them. One's called a hoop cane, one is the official Connecticut free cane, and then one's like just kind of like a T bar. So they're holding on like a T at the top and a T on the bottom. They often have rollers on. Um, some ONM specialists use these a lot with, with kids and others not so much. Um, I've used them a handful of times. It's not for everyone. Um, and I do want to like take a little commercial break and just say, whoever you are working with for your orientation mobility specialist, trust them. <laughs> um, everyone has different you know, specialties and different viewpoints and different tools that they use. Um, you know, what, what, we're, what I'm sharing with today, they may have never, never come up in a discussion before. And that's not to say that it's something that would work for your child. But like I said, I don't, I don't have all the answers and I'm not saying you need to go and ask to have an adaptive mobility device for your child. It may not be something that really works for, for them. Um, and it may not be something that they you know, have, have access to. My experience with that is with these is, um, they are so child specific and they often are used for a very brief amount of time. I personally prefer push toys and then going to a cane, um, but that's just me. I and mean, there's people that love um, adaptive mobility devices. I, my mobility people, I don't know your thoughts on that. And, you know, I'd love, I'd love to hear. <laughs> we can have the push toys as well. You go with push toys more? I think those are more natural for the student, especially when they're beginning to walk. Yeah. Uh, very natural. Yeah, if they can go to a one-handed cane right away, I encourage it. Yeah, I, I kind of, and like I said, it, there's been a couple of kids that don't have a hard time, you know, just holding on to things. And so sometimes that helps. Sometimes it backfires on you and it doesn't help at all. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just another tool. It's it's a possibility. It's something that that, that could happen. And then um, obviously the next is canes. And again, not every student has a cane, not every student needs a cane, not every student needs a cane when they're very young, some need them when they're, you know, my philosophy is, and I've worked with, with young ones, is, you know, the sooner the better, typically, but there's a lot of kids that are not ready at a very young age. They need to be, have, have some amount of stability. I'm working with a little three-year-old right now, and she's getting PT, and she's getting good for orthotics, and she is bouncing up the walls and can't walk a straight line. And, you know, she doesn't use a walker, but I don't think she might need, you know, so I'm working really closely with that PT to be like, she will be a cane user, the parents know, but when that window is going to be to give that to her, we're, we're trying to figure out. So it is so, um, it's so, so student specific. And we, it's really important that you keep that in mind. Uh, but basically, um, that cane is going to, at a very young age, one, you just want them to hold on to it. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> just hold on to it, drop it, um, give, have them have some responsibility for it so that they aren't just dropping it when they walk, when they're done with it, that they're you know, parking it, putting them, putting it in a spot. Um, but it's basically that it's tip is on the ground and that it's acting as a bumper in front of them. We want to officially have them have a di great diagonal technique in front of them that it's covering their body, but hey, if it's on the floor and it's in front of them, we're usually a pretty happy camper. <laughs> um, and eventually, you know, they're going to be working on a touch technique that there's, or they're going to be working on um, a touch and slide technique. There's all kinds of stuff that they're going to do down the road. At an early age, it's just um, having that and having it make sense that if they, if that cane hits something, they need to stop, they need to react, they need to go around it and figure out what it is and make that happen. So, um, you know, they kids can be, can be taught, you know, the different parts of the cane, what they what they do, what it means, um, that, you know, that it's gonna, it's gonna bump into something, it's, it's gonna find a curve or a drop or an obstacle. Um, but yeah, just holding it is, is number one. So there's kind of some advantages and disadvantages to using the cane. Um, it frees up, 
freeze up your other hand so that you can check things out. You can trail or you can pull the cane and walk sighted guide. Um, they, they can locate objects. You can put it your hand on the railing. You can confirm, you know, it helps you still have that orientation. Um, and then it, it's just more easily, easier to use on steps so that you're holding on to the, the railing and then using the cane. And there's obviously it's easy to store, it's easy to have it, but there's some disadvantages. It needs some, you know, you need to have kind of some mature attention, mature motor skills to understand that concept of in front and, and on the ground. It's really important. Um, it tends to leave kind of broad areas of your body unprotected to some degree. Like, you know, you can still bump into things. Um, you know, I say, kiss that doorway frame and, you know, you, there's, there's things. So you can, Ideally, using a diagonal technique and have your hand out in front, that's not a real natural way to be walking around in the world, <laughs> but that's where kind of like a hands up would be, would be coming in handy. Um, and it, it can be just a challenging thing as young, young, young little boys like to use it as a weapon, <laughs> to be a lightsaber. Um, so there's, kind of, there can be some disadvantages and that's usually a key that they're not quite ready for it yet. <laughs> so um, you wanna, you know, kind of think about reintroducing that at, an, at another time. Um, canes aren't necessarily all the, you know, the answer for everything, but I guess one of the things I wanted in, in talking about all the tools in your toolbox, it's more than just a cane. People think about mobility as, oh, they're a cane, you, you know, they use a cane and they don't cane crossing streets. And it's way more than just that. And there's a whole lot that goes into play before that even happens. Um, so I talked about a little bit, some of this, you know, is that child ready to use a cane? These are really things that need to be considered that the factors need to be discussed as the, at, with the family um, and the team members, you know, does a child walk with the stability? Um, you know, are, do they have, do they naturally walk with their with a high guard? That's not gonna work so well if they're, you know, to expect them to use a cane. Again, meet them where they're at, you know, do they even show any interest in it? Um, is the family supportive and accepting of the device? It can be um, it can be hard for some families to to know because it's it's a statement, right? It's 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 out there saying they can't see as well. Um, and there's good and bad to that as well because by having that cane, it can answer a lot of questions that people may have rather than you know they see oh you know their eyes look a little different or you know then by by seeing that cane it can answer some questions that you may be asked um, in, an un, in an uncomfortable situation. So there's good and bad to that too. I keep going back and forth here, sorry about that. Um, does the child um, understand the cause and effect of what the, that cane does and what it means? Can they actually hold on to that and maintain a grasp? It's heavy. <laughs> Do they have the strength to that? And that's again, where the OTs and PTs come into play. Um, and can they be able to do that? Can they be able to, to manipulate it? Um, do they have that abil ability to visually detect obstacles? And again, not every child who uses a cane, they're, they're not totally blind. You know, kids with low vision will use it. Kids with vision, you know, that just is affected at night or maybe are very photophobic and with kids with albinism use it outdoors only. You know, there's not, um, it's, there's lots of different situations that has it. The formula, there's not a formula that says their vision acuity is this much, so they need to use a cane. <laughs> um, it's, it's, not that, it's not that easy and it's not that clear. Um, another tool in the toolbox might be wheelchairs and lots of kids who are not walking and, and not mobile. Um, and obviously the O&M specialist should work very closely with OTs and PTs um, in, as far as making mod some modifications to that chair, there sometimes can be like little bumpers or I, I haven't had great luck with that, but almost like curb feelers along the chair so they can, they could trail if they're able to use their hands enough while they're in their chair, they can be trailing along um, so that they know and understand where they're at being, having them as interactive in, in moving from place to place, pushing the buttons on the elevator, pushing, helping push the door open helping make decisions of which way to turn, if they know they're left and right, or just pointing what direction. Um, it's just really important that, again, just because a child's in a wheelchair and isn't gonna walk with a cane doesn't mean they don't need O&M. And there's different ways that O&M can be serving those children um, in, a, in a wheelchair. 
whether it's working directly with the uh, with the other team members or working one on one with them and, and learning things in the community. Um, they can be aware of the things like the landmarks and clues. Um, working both indoors and outdoors, planning how it's using the neighborhood. And like I said, just having them involved as they are moving in their chair is so important. So, so important. Um, just some other little things that would be in the toolbox that the, like, maybe did not talk about. So we're gonna have our little teeny tiny sunglasses, but having them, again, give them a, give them their own pace so that they're responsible for it, for them and put them in a special place. Um, this is one of my favorite little things. I had a student who had such a hard time concentrating and we had a thinking cap. And every time he went on mobility, he put on his thinking cap so he could concentrate and think. And as silly as it sounds, <laughs> um, at least for a little while. Um, they might, you know, to in, you could introduce just some simple um, maps and make them into like, part of their a place map so that they can start learning about mapping, okay? So they may not actually, they're not gonna be able to understand that. You can change it to be as, um, as age appropriate as possible. And when we talked about pains, I forgot to show, you wanna make them as fun as possible too. And there's a little bit of a different therapists, again, and so different therapists have different ideas, but, for kids who might be not as accepting of the cane, letting them design their own cane and making it color coordinated, you can you can order special canes. Um, and oftentimes, as kids get older, this is obviously was was for a kind of an older an older child. Um, when they had like their fun cane for school because it was their rainbow cane, she called it. And then she had a standard red and white cane that we use when we were in the community and crossing the streets because the people in the communities know more of standard red and white paint, hopefully, um, versus, versus that. So, and then another tool that would eventually, hopefully be found would be um, a monocular to be able to see things at a distance. So be able to read signs in, the, in their classroom, to be able to read all of those wonderful things that teachers put at the, and across the room and the number board and all that sort of stuff. Okay, Ooh, I'm gonna have to fly. It's my problem and I never have enough time. Okay, so really quick, I just wanna say really quick, but um, next we're gonna get into our toy box. And we're gonna, there's toys in the, our toy box, my, there's gonna be more than just toys. It's gonna be just play spaces, spaces that you, that they have, that they feel comfortable and that they wanna, um, that they want to play in tactile toys that will involve two-handed manipulation, sound toys to localize and move towards, um, movement games, songs, matching objects, um, everyday objects that turn into toys. And then of course, balls, cars, movement toys that help with tracking and books about mobility, about signs, about safety, all of that sort of stuff. So, it was right through this here. Um, when we talk about predictable and safe play spaces, it can mean something different. I'm gonna show real quick. Um, some of you have probably and may have seen like the official Lily Nielsen Little Room, as well as maybe some like adapted mobility play space um, that would, but it, it doesn't have to be all fancy like that either. It can be, you know, just like every little kid has um, just a little mobile that they that they play in. It can be a kitchen cabinet that you empty out and you put stuff in and they go in that little cabinet and they, the sound is totally different there, right? It can be a corner of a room that you play, lay down the blanket and you put a chair next to it so that there's there or a, a box or whatever or a table next to it so that they they have a little bit of a different sound and then they can use the wall and they can hang some things on the wall or you know it doesn't have to be official <laughs> there's so many things that you can just kind of do on your own but it's really important that kids feel safe in their in their play space right so that they want to reach out and play, it's gonna start off just things on their body, things that are within arm's reach. And then we wanna be moving towards things that they, um, 
learn, once you learn kind of their favorite items and what, again, what motivates them, um, having them move towards them and, um, and get out and explore. So at the end here, I just mentioned to, you know, just a large box, someone gets a refrigerator in town, get that box. <laughs> Those are great. Um, and not only just to, to explore, but it can help them understand about doors and windows. It, you know, you can, you can do all kinds of things like that. Um, so play spaces are, are important and just, again, giving them that sense of ownership. Um, so your home, obviously, is their most familiar environment. They're going to be most comfortable. They're going to be cruising, hopefully, and, and moving around. You want to be having, encouraging them to trail. And talking about landmarks, like we mentioned, um, it's okay to change those things, like I said, but you want to make sure you orient them if they if things are changed. Um, and associating sounds and smells, we mentioned those types of things. Um, and as free of clutter as you can get, <laughs> easier said than done. Um, but when I have just a couple, uh, I have a lot of toys in here, obviously, but even just things for kids who, you know, want to be, might be looking at stringing objects, but for some, that's really a hard thing because the string is moving. Um, it's it's not stable, but just get a, just get a stick and that's the kind of the same thing as stringing objects, but it's a little bit more in control. And these are just beads from Michael's, you know, that have, so, as much as like this is an OT type of thing, it's also a you know I mean it's it's understanding concepts. It's having them use use two hands together. There are official from American Printing House. It's really obnoxious. Oh, it's not working. It's not obnoxious. That is not that. Um, it goes beep 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 beep. beep. That's what it's supposed to do. It was charged overnight. It's but it's you hear that? It's like barely fairly working. Okay, so there are some official sound balls that you can, that will, can be ordered, but something as simple as um, a cat toy from Walmart can be just as good or even better sometimes. <laughs> and I know some people might have a hard time with like mouse toys or cat toys that they would share with their children, but they're, they're, if they're safe for, if they're safe for them and they don't look like, you know, that, I think it's, they're just as good and usually a whole lot cheaper, <laughs> a whole lot. Um, so that's really fun. When we talk to about um, balls, obviously just any kind of ball tracking would be great, but these little Velcro paddles are great because then we can, instead of playing catch, it's playing catch is really hard, but if they have that, it gives them, but they have to be able to interact with an object. Um, the hide and seek toys that are out there, you'll be able to hear this. Um, that there's there's great, you know, it's a cute little puppy. I'm a beautiful puppy. But if you press and hold, So I'm going to hide them and he's quiet, but every couple 20 seconds, hopefully, um, he'll give you, he'll talk. And so there's, you know, you can set like a beeper or something that's constantly going for them. So if you're practicing sound mobilization, I'm not talking to the dog. <laughs> um, but having that constant... He's gonna act up on me. Um, he says you found me. Um, but um, having something that talks periodically can really help with you know they can start moving towards it and then stop and if they hear it again, it's not going to operate with me. Then they would you know be able to to be able to find that. It truly did work. I think my student that uses this loves him to pieces and may have dropped him a few times. But um, <laughs> these are things that you can obviously just find out on Amazon. Lots and lots of books about safety, about me on the map, official books that's really old, a cane in her hand. Again, showing my game. Um, cars and toys, 
that you know like be preloaded that will that will move are always really fun. Even things as simple as we can get into things just like a great old pan and some big marbles cutting a hole and just having to be able to use two hands of putting it in. Same as all those toy sh shape sorters, but those shape sorters are really hard. Um, something like this, then you can just get an extra lid. I have it over here. Um, and then some, some other things so that they can practice, you know, feeling again, using two hands and putting things in. So at this time of year with Easter, I love eggs. And so I'm just taking regular eggs and these are just normal ones, putting things in and making your own music eggs or shaker eggs, making two that sound the same and having them try to match the sounds. Um, it's much harder than you think. <laughs> um, and just, and then putting them, you know, put, using a bowl for them to, to put them in. But then also taking the time when you, when you have like this obsession with certain things like this, <laughs> this time of year, I got a little, it's embarrassing to say how many eggs and how many egg cartons I have in my thing, but just taking, taking them and adding, gluing things to them, little Velcro, feathers, whatever you can think of, and then making tactile matching eggs, making sets of that. Um, Band-aid, sandpaper can be just a, a, a fun thing to do to add to that, add to that toolbox. Okay, what am I doing? I'm tired. We're gonna be, we're gonna be calling it close. Okay. So last, and I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Yet. Our last is our treasure box. And that's, like I said, that's the good stuff. That's what you're working towards. And you all have a little treasure box on your, on your spot there too, that you can take, or if you don't want it, that's fine too. Again, I won't be, <laughs> I won't be offended. Um, but think about how you want to fill that treasure box, how your child might want to fill that treasure box. What are things that are um, adventures for them? I often say, you know, when I, I try for certain kids, especially, um, you know, just going on a lesson, you're going on an adventure. And what is that adventure going to be for them? It's going to be something different all the time, hopefully. Um, really quick before I forget, if everyone can look at in their treasure box, there's a few that have an O&M rock. There's five of them, but actually I'm on this table. Um, so if you if you are one of the O&M rock, I love rocks too. Um, if you are one of the O&M rock winners, you can come and pick up one of the extra, one of these little things. I have a twelve pack a twelve pack of eggs <laughs> that some of actually I did. I put I kept some some of them half things in. If you do put some things in, I suggest that you put tape around it so the kids don't open it. Obviously, I didn't do that. Um, one of my favorite books, Pete's Puddles, because that's one of the great treasures and adventures is going for outdoor outdoor adventures and walks. Um, that is not real. Or a light up eyeball. Um, just on a tea light or a little eyeball, dip clip, or um, a little can, a, a sort of thing. Okay, so before we leave, if you got that, come and pick that up. Okay. Um, so treasure boxes are gonna be other than th things in that treasure box are going to be what's other than in your home, um, getting them out. We want to be having them feel comfortable in other people's homes, visiting grandparents, visiting family, friends, being outdoors, being in the, you know, starting in their yard, your yard, maybe just starting on your porch um, or on your deck, right? And then getting in your yard and exploring the yard. Um, it doesn't have to be a big yard. You don't have to have acres and acres for, for these kids. It's just being out there, being barefoot in the yard is would be wonderful and huge, but we know that that might not happen right away. So starting um, with a blanket on the grass and then moving towards, you know, being off the grass and exploring, um, visiting parks, just going for a walk in the neighborhood on the sidewalk. This is so sensitive, I'm sorry. Um, and, and then obviously things in the community. Um, your neighborhood, the school that they're going to be going to, playgrounds, um, and then stores of obviously the stores in your community, libraries, all the things that you want to take advantage of. 
Um, you know, sometimes just visiting other people's homes can be a lot for kids, right? And so having some realistic expectations, you know, if they get invited to a birthday party, maybe they can come over and visit that house before the actual birthday party um, or, and, 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 you know, and get oriented to that room that they're going to be spending time in or if they're going to be outdoors. And so they know what to expect. So they don't, you know, be overwhelmed and not be able to enjoy it. So it's just, you know, they're, how they act in home, obviously, I have to tell you, is can be very different than how they act in other people's homes and are in other communities. Um, so just, you know, being obviously being sensitive to that. Um, one of my favorite things in every treasure box is the great outdoors. And I have a whole presentation on just that. But um, like I said, just starting small and, and working, working big, um, working up is, is great. And sometimes it's just they need you to model what to do outdoors. Um, and it's not just kids that are originally impaired. Kids in general these days don't spend a lot of time outside. Um, they're indoors, they're on their games, they're on their, you know, electronics, and that all serves a purpose, right? But um, just being outdoors, even just, you know, 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, two minutes a day, you know, start and and build up to give them that, um, that appreciation. Because, you know, maybe they will find a love for sticks that look like dolphins. Or, you know, they can start their own stick collection. They can start their own rock collection. Be what it looks like from there, but I have an obsession with heart rocks, you know, and once you start looking for something, um, obviously they, they would need some time, but boy, you know, there's some beaches, you could just pop that, those kiddos down in, in the rocks and have them explore. What a great tactile, you know, tactile experience. Maybe they can go for a bug walk and look for bugs or at night look for lightning bugs. And, you know, June is coming up, we're going to have lots of time. Um, flying a kite, maybe they just want to get out and have that feeling and that sensation of, of flying a kite. Whatever it is, um, figure it out. Just have a min or binoculars here. And oftentimes that's a that's a step to get, getting getting used to being using a monocular would be just having that bin binoculars and having them feel like they are going on an adventure. Um, obviously, when you're outdoors, all those things that we talked about too of having contrast you know, using things that are high contrast, using landmarks and clues, um, you know, take all those things into account. But, you know, let them get dirty. <laughs> it's okay. Let them get dirty, let them play in the water, let them hug a tree, um, and let them be out in all different weather. I mean, obviously not if there's a tornado warning or storm warnings, but, you know, a little rain never hurt anyone and going for a rain walk and using an umbrella, what a great experience. The sounds are different. Um, it's yeah, it's it's a great type of thing. Then obviously all of the um, opportunities that the community involved. And I know taking your kids to the grocery store is not always the most pleasant acti activity. <laughs> but um, you know, don't do it when you need to get all your groceries for the next two weeks. Maybe go when you only need one or two items, and take it in small steps. Let them explore um, time in the in the produce department. Um, or that sort of thing. So, you know, working up towards being able to go to the community pool <laughs> or um, going to the beach and all of that sort of stuff is, is just so important. And then obviously um, the other big treasure box that's ahead for them is school and getting them used to being able to be at school. You know, maybe your school neighborhood, their playground is open and you can start visiting that on a regular basis and they can get comfortable and know about that playground. Um, you can always talk to the team members and, and visit the school before or off hours um, to get oriented to the layout of the school. Again, looking for landmarks and rooms and, and all that kind of stuff is really important. Um, and then taking some time to like actually be there during the school day because there's a whole lot of noises and sensory things that go on that. The bells, the crowds, um, the bathrooms. Practice the bathrooms, practice those little latches. <laughs> and I, I've had this poor little boy is in kindergarten. He's like, I got locked in the bathroom again. I'm like, you know, like, it's big stuff that happens in these in these schools that you might not think about. Practice the doors. <laughs> um, okay, so basically we're gonna, in summary, you know, 
like I said, o &M, it's not limited to just cane skills. It's instead, it's, it's learning a confident way of engaging with their world, of having that world, their world make sense. And their world is going to start out really small and you want it to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And doing that in a, in a giving them those safe areas to play, helping them feel secure. Um, oh, the battery is running low, just so you know. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, and just involving them in all activities, obviously. Um, and keeping in mind that genuinely helping your child sometimes might not mean physically helping them. It might mean just giving them, talking them through the process of giving your, you know, sitting on your hands and, and just talking through and that, and that um, going through that um, and just encouraging them to participate, take a risk, take a chance. Um, but most of all, I just, as parents or grandparents or caregivers or whatever your role is, you know, keep in mind, you know your child best. You're their number one advocate. You're their number one supporter. Um, you have lots of you're their forever teacher <laughs> and you're gonna have lots of people coming in and out of your life, giving you lots of advice, which is great. But, um, and you wanna take that obviously, but you also, you know, you, you know them the best and keep that in mind. Um, and o and you're doing it all the time, whether you're, whether you realize it or not. Um, so it is important to have that relationship and to know what they're doing with their o and teacher so that you can follow through with that. But not look at it as like, but keep in mind, you're not their teacher, <laughs> that, that you don't have to take it on that role as well. Yes, you want to follow through with it, but do it in a natural way. Don't think about, I have to do 30 minutes of O&M to get through. You know, like, it's just going to be part of your part of your day and make it fun and make it natural and make it not work. Um, respecting their fears and helping them feel safe and get past all that. Okay, so we have just a short time and get outside. <laughs> um, we have a short time, sorry, for some simulation, blindfold, but I know that, not that lunch isn't important, but lunch is next. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, if I'm happy to stay as long as, as long as anyone wants. And like I said, if people are not comfortable doing blindfold or simulation things, that's okay as well. But um, what I want to encourage you is to find a partner because I don't want, um, however many are here, 20 people wear blindfolds and start walking around. <laughs> so you're going to find a partner. One is going to be um, your guide to keep you safe. The other will take take a turn. And you have a choice of either up here in this little David's feet. You can wear a blindfold. It might need to be adjusted a little. Or on this back table in the um, towards the back are some simulators. So depending on what you want, or you could take one of each and, and try one of each if you would like. Um, there's a lineup of canes along the way um, on this table. 